Paul mentioned, I want you to think about three questions. First, and you don't have to answer them. The first question is, where did we get Jesus? Second question is, where did we get the Bible? And the third is, where do we get salvation? And the answer to all three of those questions, as you may know, is the church. Absolutely. Uh, just a little bit of uh, history. Where did we get Jesus? Well, the church was founded by Jesus Christ in the year 33. And the first split, uh, for the first thousand years or so, to say that you were a Christian meant that you were Catholic. And then the first split in Christianity called the Great Schism happened in 1054, and that's when the Eastern Orthodox broke off from the Catholic Church. And then we had the Protestant Reformation happen in the 16th century. So whether you're Protestant or not, whether you're Orthodox or whomever, if you trace back the history, you'll see that Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel came from the Catholic Church. Even if you say you're a non-church goer, well, I've never been to church in my life, but I know about Jesus Christ. Well, you may have heard about him from other people in society and our culture. And where was that seed planted? It was founded by the church. So that's a wonderful thing for us to realize. Okay, the Bible. The Bible as we know it didn't come about until about the year 400. Because up until then, there was no canon for the Bible. In other words, the books for the Bible hadn't been picked out. How do you know which books go in the Bible? <clears throat> well, you don't. You need some sort of teaching authority, some apostolic authority, to figure out which books go in the Bible. Because there's no sacred uh, table of contents in the Bible. There was nothing written in the Bible saying which books go in. So the church decided upon that. And by the way, the books of the Bible, the New Testament mainly, were written by the church, the apostles and the saints. And then it was compiled by the church. And then those blessed Benedictines, I was a Benedictine monk, they went bleary-eyed copying those because they didn't have printing presses back then. And by the way, most people couldn't even read the Bible, couldn't even read. So how did they learn of the church? Through preaching, through mass, through stained glass, through statues, through different things like that. And finally, where do we get salvation? Well, we get salvation from the church because of course, the church preaches Jesus Christ, who gives us that message of salvation. But I also want you to think of it in t terms of concretely. For instance, think of where did you get baptized? Where did you receive First Communion? How did you receive confession? And where did you get confirmed? These are all sacraments of salvation. Think about that baptism. You're washed clean clean of your sins, the Eucharist, receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ, reconciliation, all of these are sacraments of salvation and they all come from the church, right? But how many times do we get on our knees at night and thank God for his holy Catholic church for giving us all these sacraments? How many of us do that? We got one, we got Skeeter. I know for me, I don't do that every day. And yet, when, when I think about what the church has given me, I think, wow, what incredible gifts these are. So the church really, indeed, is a wonderful home. It's a wonderful family providing us with these wonderful gifts that a lot of people take for granted. Okay, first thing that I want to talk about, oh, and by the way, here. So I had this quote that I said over the weekend from Fulton J. Sheen, who addressed the fact that there were so many people who hated the Catholic Church but really didn't understand the church. And his quote is this, there are not over 100 people in the United States who hate the Roman Catholic Church. There are millions, however, who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church. And so that's a real great strategy. So hopefully through classes like these, you can tell other people what the truth and the beauty of the church is. Okay, so what is the church? Well, I found a real good handy dandy explanation from this book, from Beginning Apologetics, which by the way is a wonderful series. The definition from that series says this, when Christ established his church, the new Israel, he set up a living, continuing authority to teach, govern, and sanctify in his name. And so the church is a living, continuing authority, authority to teach, govern, and sanctify in Jesus' name, and it was established by Jesus. It's 
living because Jesus lives on through his Holy Spirit, and we are also the body of Christ. It's continuing the apostolic authority that was begun with Jesus and the 12 apostles and St. Peter that governs. We have an ecclesiastical hierarchy, and it sanctifies. It sanctifies through the preaching of the gospel and through the sacraments, and that's how we're made holy, and that's how we're brought in communion with God and how we're going to heaven. So that is the church's mission. And by, way, by the way, all of these notes are on out, an outline that I've produced, so please remind me at the end. I'm going to be passing those out. Okay, so is this really true? Is this what the church really does? Let's take a look at the Bible. This is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. It says this, and I'll give you the backdrop. This is the very last chapter of Matthew, and Jesus appears to the 11 disciples. Now, not 12, because Judas had betrayed and he had killed himself. So there are only 11. But he appears to them, and here's what he has to say. He says, says Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold... I am with you always until the end of the age. Now you notice the first thing that he says is, all power in, in, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, I'm God. I am God and I'm telling you this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He's giving the church a direct command. The apostles. That's why she does what she does. That's why we have the sacraments. That's why we have the magisterium and tradition and the Bible and the gospel and, and the mass and the Eucharist. And we have all those other fun things too, like RE and RCIA, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, baptismal prep and marriage prep. And you might think, oh, I've got to go to those things. <laughs> well, he's saying, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why do we baptize? Because Jesus has told the eleven to do so. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now I think that's a key phrase right there. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. A lot of people have hang-ups about church doctrine. Or church teachings. And they say, why does the church teach that? Why does the church say that? And some people would say, how dare the church say that? What authority do they have? One of my friends, the church is doing only what she's been asked to do by Jesus himself, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. I'm going to be with you in my Holy Spirit. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to direct you through my Holy Spirit. I'm going to teach you what I want you to teach them. And that's why the church does what she does. Now, why would he do this? And this is an important point. Why would Jesus give them this command? Well, shortly after, Jesus is going to heaven. So Jesus is in heaven, and when he was here on earth, he had an earthly mission, right? He, he preached, he taught, he healed, he forgave sins, he brought, brought people back to God. But now he's up in heaven, so how is his earthly ministry of salvation going to be carried on? Through a living body through a church. So he's entrusting his teachings to the apostles so that they would carry on this message faithfully. And that's a key word, faithfully, with integrity. Because 2,000 years is a long time. And when you've got that much history behind you, what starts out to be a pure gospel message in 2,000 years could very easily be watered down or be misconstrued or taken in a totally different way and taught differently. And so the church throughout its 2,000 years, has maintained faithfulness to that original gospel message. So that's why he does this, so that he can carry on the message, so that he can save other people. There's this wonderful quote here from Peter Kreeft, and he's a great Catholic author. He's a convert, by the way, from Protestantism. And he says this, The church is not something man makes after he is saved, but something God makes to save man. Let me repeat that again. The church is not something man makes after he is saved, but something God makes to save man. 
So this isn't man-made religion. Some people object to the church being man-made. No, it's not man-made. It's God-made. God makes this for us to be saved. And so we're very fortunate to have this church by which God is speaking to us through the teachings and through the preaching of his message. So in essence, what Peter Kraft is saying is that the church saves us. In the early church, they uh, had an image of the, the church as being the ark, like Noah's ark. And there was the great flood, you know, and so we all got on this ark, which is the church. And so we were all saved by getting on this gigantic boat. And so the church is that ark. So the church saves us. And why would the church save us? Because the church can't do it alone. The church saves us because the church is about Jesus Christ. The church is about this man right here who died and gave his life for us. So the church is about Jesus Christ. And if there's one point that I want to leave you with, with this talk is that the church is about Jesus Christ. And behold, the church is Jesus Christ. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So this is the message he proclaimed, that she proclaims. This is the message that she teaches. This is the message that's being sent. There's a wonderful quote from Vatican II, and it says, Christ is the light of humanity, and it is accordingly the heartfelt desire of the sacred council being gathered together in the Holy Spirit, that by proclaiming his gospel to every creature, it may bring to all men that light of Christ which shines visibly from the church. So the church is bringing the light of Christ to the world. That is its mission. Don't ever think that the church is just about a bunch of men making up rules. No, the church is about Jesus Christ, and the church has always maintained that. The church goes on to say, the church has no other light than Christ's. According to a favorite image of the church fathers, the church is like the moon in all its light reflected from the sun. So the church is like the moon, and our sun, S-O-N, who is the S-U-N, Jesus Christ, is the light that shines on the church, which is the moon. And so all the, all the glory, all the grace, all the salvation comes from Jesus Christ, and the church reflects that. So this is her mission. This is who she is about. And indeed, this is what the church is. Because what are we called? We are called the body of Christ, right? So the church indeed is Christ. And there's this wonderful quote from St. Joan of Arc, and she sums it up really well. About Jesus Christ and the church, I simply know they're just one thing, and we shouldn't complicate the matter. Amen to that. <laughs> I'm done with my presentation. <laughs> but there's more. Go for it. <laughs> Wonderful quote. Okay, so let's get into the definition of the church. The church, the word, comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means assembly or convocation. And that's what the ancient Israelites were referred to. They were referred to as an assembly. So the ancient Israelites, the chosen people, the chosen race. So the church, by calling herself the church or assembly early on, was actually referring to itself as the new Israel. Because we are the new chosen people. Not that the Israelites are no longer the chosen, but we've been grafted on, so to speak, as St. Paul talks about. And we are now a part of that chosen race which is a wonderful thing. And we get all the gifts that come along with that. Now, the church was founded by Jesus Christ, which is obviously an important point because sometimes people wonder, where did the church start? But we can trace our lineage, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, back to the original 12 apostles and to Jesus Christ, to 33 AD and beyond. Now, Jesus Christ Pick 12 apostles, one of whom was St. Peter, and he would become what? The rock. The rock. He'd become the rock, and that, this rock would become what? The first, pope. the first pope. Right. And so St. Francis is the latest apostolic successor to Peter, but he also picked 11 other disciples who would become the 12 apostles. Now, why did Jesus pick 12? Right, to, to signify the 12 tribes of Israel. And so you want to know whether or not the, the apostles that he chose were special? Take a look at this verse from Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, that you who have followed me in the new age, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, 
will yourselves sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Are the 12 apostles special? You bet. Have they been commissioned by Jesus Christ to teach and preach in his name? Yes. You bet. And they're going to be sitting on 12 thrones at the end of time judging the 12 tribes of Israel. All from a band of mostly fishermen <laughs> and a tax collector. Yeah. But Jesus can do what he wills through anybody because he's God. Wonderful stuff. So we are the body of Christ. Now how is this so? Well, it's because we're the mystical body of Christ. And you know, sometimes you hear, hear the 12 apostles sitting on the 12 thrones in Jesus Christ. And sometimes the best information I get from my talks, often, I take from others. And here's something that Father uh, Dan talked about one time that really struck, struck home with me. He said, we're the mystical body of Christ because, remember the Acts of the Apostle, how Saul, or St. Paul, was converted? Okay, he was on his way to Damascus, and then he fell off his horse, so to speak. Well, that's not actually in the Acts of the Apostles. But he, was, he fell to the ground, and he was blinded by this light. And all of a sudden, there was this voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, sir? And he says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, if Jesus is in heaven telling him that, how on earth is he persecuting Jesus here on earth? Well, he's doing that because he's putting to death people like St. Stephen, the church's first martyr. He's locking up other Christians. He's persecuting uh, Christians in general. But he, they're here down on earth. But if the church indeed is the body of Christ and Jesus is its head, then sure, then Paul is hurting Jesus' body and Paul is hurting Jesus himself because we are the mystical body of Christ. And so this is the passage right here. On his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who, you are, who are you, sir? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And that indeed was who he was persecuting because he was persecuting the church, the body of Christ. Now, St. Paul, later on, when he got converted, wrote some wonderful letters. And in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the church being one body, but many parts. Remember that one song goes, we are many parts, we are all one body. Okay, it's referring to this passage. And so he's saying that we are one body in Christ, although we have many parts. Here's what he says. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one, are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. So here is this one body, which is Christ, and we're all baptized into this one body. But he goes on to say, later on, a few verses later, he says, now you are Christ's body. And he's addressing this to the church. And individually, parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work mighty deeds? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts. Now notice how he's referring to the body of Christ to the church. As soon as he says that you are Christ's body, he names all the different functions of the church, the different parts of that body, as, as designated in the church, apostles, prophets, and teachers. So you can see here from the teaching of St. Paul that the body of Christ is indeed the church, and that we all have many parts, we have different functions, and we all have different gifts to offer to the church. So think about that. You may be called, I know a lot of you are volunteers already, and you offer your time, talents, and wealth to the church, but think about how you can offer your gifts to the church because you are part of Christ's body. Okay. All right, now I want to talk about the church being the people of God, or as Scott Hahn says, the family of God. And this is a wonderful image. If you ever want a general idea of what the church is, it's you, it's me. We're the family of God. There's a wonderful passage from St. Paul in Ephesians. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, 
but you are fellow citizens with the holy ones and members of the household of God. Well, what's a household? It's a family. It's a family of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the capstone. You know, Scott Hahn, he has this wonderful imagery of us being the family of God. And he says, we have God the Father. We have a mother in Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary. We have Jesus Christ, who is our brother. We have our brothers and sisters who are the saints and the angels. We celebrate their birthdays, right? Their feast days. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate God's birthday. We even celebrate the birth of Mary. We have family gatherings in which we share stories. And what are those family gatherings? Mass, mass right. And at this mass, we have a family meal, right? <coughs> which is the Eucharist. And we also have an heirloom as well. And what is that? It's the Bible. Family is... <laughs> we actually have a lot of heirlooms, but one of the, the greatest is the Bible. But it reminds me of my own, uh, my grandmother's 100th birthday. Uh, I went home a couple, a few months ago for my grandmother, grandmother's 100th birthday. Can you imagine living to be 100 years old? No. <laughs> she was born... <laughs> she was born in 1914. And... Uh, so I went home back to Seattle for that family reunion. And so we got together at this church hall, and here she, are, she is, she's like the matriarch of the family. She's the one bringing us all together. I wouldn't be here without her, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, she's kind of like God in that sense, bringing us together. So we got together, and we laughed, and we shared stories. I got to see relatives I hadn't seen in years. And then we shared a family meal. We had great Japanese food, you know, we had teriyaki chicken and sushi, and we had Chinese food as well because we've got some Chinese in-laws in our family. And we had a, a beautiful cake at the end, and we gave that to her, and it was, it, was, it was beautiful, and it was special, and there was a photographer there taking pictures, and a few weeks later, we came out with a picture book. And my dad and their other relatives, they distributed to all the family members. And so I have that now. And that's a family heirloom that I'm going to treasure forever. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful description of the family of God, us, the Catholic Church. We have all of those elements. And isn't that a warm, wonderful feeling? God isn't just some distant stranger, but he's called us to be his own as children of God, to be called into the family of God, which is what the church is. <clears throat> Family of God, there it is. We're also the bride of Christ. Um, I don't have enough time to get into that. We're also the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, an important point that I want to bring about, about the church, is that it's both a spiritual and institutional reality. So, in other words, we are a visible entity. We are a visible reality. A lot of people would say, well, the church has no organization. Well, the church should be purely invisible. Well, Christ set this church to be a visible reality. He said it's uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, a city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, and that's who we are. So it's both a spiritual and an institutional reality. And some people would say, well, why is that? Why would Jesus Christ establish something that was visible and institutional? Anybody harbor a guess? Anybody like to guess? Well, the short answer to that is because without it, we would have anarchy. We'd have chaos. And then how would the message be said? If there were, if you look at all the great nations and all the great companies and corporations and all those kinds of things, what do they have? They have leadership. They have a governing body. They have laws. They have order. They have a structure. They have all these things. Because Jesus knew that left our own devices without the, those kinds of things, we'd have anarchy and chaos, and the message would have just gotten lost somewhere. So that's a very important point to, to know. You know, I had this friend in high school, his name was Grant Bowen, and uh, he was going through his punk rock stage. And uh, now, now, mind you, I didn't go through my punk rock stage, uh, but, but we were friends, and I was into skateboarding, and so uh, that was kind of part of the package. Well, we were swimming one day, and we were with some friends, and he goes, he goes, man, that would be so cool if we had anarchy, if we didn't have any government, if we just had anarchy. And then I had this other friend, Jason Chu, 
And we just looked at each other and we just shook our heads, you know. <laughs> he, he was thinking about, you know, the dead Kennedys and anarchy in the UK, and so maybe I do, do know a few songs, okay? But, <laughs> but he was thinking about those things and he was a teenager. And he thought, wouldn't that be great? I could do anything that I want. Well, you know what, if you want to get somewhere, namely heaven, you can't. <laughs> you need some guidance, and so that's why we have a church. And so I'm thinking to myself, without anarchy, that's great until somebody shows up at your door and you know, wants to rob you or maybe even kill you, and there's no police to protect you. There's no structure there. We need infrastructure. We need leadership. That's just common sense, and that's why we have a church. But the church is also a spiritual reality, too, because some people say, well, for instance, that Vatican II, that was a lark. You know, that Vatican II, some people just forget about that. Just Forget about, no, well, you know what? The Holy Spirit was there. Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit is with the church hierarchy, is with the church, no matter what the church says. And so you have to believe that there's a spiritual element as well, because if it's namely just going through the motions in a hierarchical system with rules and order and all this stuff, and the God, even with the great message of salvation, and you lose the fact that Jesus is with us, with his Holy Spirit, you lose the soul of the church. And that's what leads us to God. So you gotta have both. Okay, how are we doing on time? Oh, we gotta get going. Okay. <laughs> now I wanna switch gears. I wanna talk about the authority of the church. By what authority do you preach and teach in God's name? Well, we uh, teach, <laughs> I'm gonna get into that. And I'm gonna get into the biblical foundation for this as well. You know, some people take umbrage to the fact that the church has authority. But the reason why is because people look at the church's authority in human terms. They think of it as human authority, right? Well, if you come on behalf of yourself and you say, you need to do this, you need to be do doing, uh, doing that, this or the other thing, sure, yeah, who are you to tell me that? But if you believe that it comes from divine authority, from God himself, that's another thing altogether. So let's take a look at that. I already mentioned the Great Commissioning of Matthew chapter 28. He's given them authority to preach and teach in his name. Now I want to mention John chapter 20, verses 21, verses 23. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. I want to stop right there for a moment. He's saying to the, to the disciples, here's the backdrop. I forgot to give you that. This is before he has appeared to the disciples after his death. They're locked away, they're scared, he appears to them, he shows them his hands and his side, and they're just ecstatic. And he says to them, peace be with you. And what's the first thing that he says other than that? He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. You know the word apostle, 12 apostles? You know what that means? It means one who is sent. That's exactly what he's talking about right here. Jesus is sending them, but it's not just sending them, okay, you go along your merry way. He's sending them with divine authority. He's saying, as the Father has sent me, God the Father himself, so I send you as God, and I send you out to preach and teach in my name. Folks, that's a lot of authority. <laughs> that's a lot of backing. It's like being a delegate or a foreign ambassador. You know, they speak on behalf of that particular nation. You don't want to mess with that foreign ambassador, especially if he's from the United States or China or Russia, or you know, because he's got the backing of the whole government, the whole nation behind them. He speaks on behalf of that nation. Kind of works the same way with the apostles. They've been given this divine authority, and behold, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's the word apostle comes from, to send forth, to commission. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Let me break this down. So he's telling them to go forth. He's giving them the divine authority. And then he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Because basically what he's saying to them is, I want you to go and preach and teach in my name, but I know that you can't do it by yourselves. You need some power. You need some inspiration. You need me. And I'm going to be in heaven, but I'm going to be sending my spirit and giving it to you. And that's the Holy Spirit, God himself. Remember, one God and three persons. And that spirit is going to be with you to help you along and guide you and give you power. So he's telling them to go out in his name. And he's saying, I'm going to give you power. 
And finally, he says, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. This is where the church gets the sacrament of confession, directly from the, this verse. But the sacrament of confession needs to be seen in the context of the whole message of salvation. Jesus is giving the church's message in a nutshell right here. He's saying, go out. I'm giving you power. I'm sending you forth in my name. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. And your mission is to forgive sins so that all may be saved, right? Because isn't that what Jesus' mission was? For the salvation of men? So go out there and forgive those sins. And you know what? One of those ways you're going to do it is through the sacrament of confession. It's going to be through the gospel. It's going to be through the message, the whole package. And that needs to be seen in the context of the whole message of salvation that Jesus was handing on to the disciples with authority. And that's why the church does what she does. Okay, next passage here. There's the Holy Spirit. Ah, the dove coming down, descending on us. As I've already explained, the apostle means one who is sent with authority, one who is commissioned. So that's why in Luke chapter 10, verses 16, Jesus says, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Wow, those are some powerful words. Whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. That be God the Father. But those first two lines, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. He's basically saying, hey, if they reject your teachings, if they reject the church and what she teaches, they're rejecting me. If they accept them and let them enter their heart and live by them, they're accepting me. Wow, that's a lot of authority. He is giving that to the apostles and thereby the church. Okay, and finally, a passage that as Catholics we all have to remember. Very important. This is Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. And this is the passage where Jesus proclaims, or Peter proclaims Jesus to be the Messiah. And this is where Jesus tells Peter what his role in the church is going to be. So let's break this down. So here's the backdrop. We've got the uh, disciples and Jesus. And Jesus asks the disciples in private. He says, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, some say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist. And then he turns to Peter, who is the ringleader, who would become the first pope. And he turns to him and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says this. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Let me unpack this for you. First of all, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jodah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. He's saying, ding, 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 ding. You got it right. That is the right answer. And it wasn't because of your own feeble mind that you understood this, but my heavenly Father gave you that insight. And as a result, here's the deal, Peter. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now this is a very important line. This is a play on words. Because Peter means rock. It's translated Petros in Greek. In the original Aramaic, it's Kepha. So sometimes you see the word Kephos for Peter. That also means Peter. That's the Aramaic. So he's saying, and so I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. You are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And of course, what does this rock become? The first, yeah, the church, and the first pope. He becomes the first pope of the church. Now, Jonah, now notice Jesus. He says, and upon this rock, you, I will build my church. He doesn't say your church. He doesn't say a man-made church. He doesn't say a church. He says my church. Is the Catholic Church Jesus' church? Absolutely. We get this from this passage. I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. You know, the church has seen famine, wars, plagues, scandals, and people marvel at the fact that for 2,000 years it exists. 
how can all that that church with those old guys with the funny clothes and everything exist for 2,000 years? You guys have to so people who object look at that and they say, you know what, there must be something to it. Well, obviously, because in scriptures, Jesus says, the gates of another world shall not prevail against it. That's why we're still around, and that's why we're going to still be around until the end of time. He goes on, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What do keys do? Open. They open and lock things, right? They open and shut things. Now, what's the image that we have of St. Peter? What does he do? He, he's the gatekeeper, right? There's the, the, the pearly gates, and you've got the image, and he's got a book, and he's looking there to see if you're on the book. Hopefully, hopefully at that time, your name is going to be on in that book. And he said, oh, let's see, Robert. Hmm, I don't know, maybe he stuck you in the back somewhere. I'm not sure where he is. So he's looking. Well, Jesus, where do we get that image? From Jesus right here, he's saying, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Wow, he's opening and he's unlocking heaven to all here on earth so that we can get to our heavenly home. Wow, that is some powerful authority he's giving Peter. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, what does that mean? When we say something binding, something is binding, what does that mean? It means it holds fast, it's firm, it's, it holds firm, it's true, it binds, it's there, it's the truth. So what this means is two things. Jesus is giving Peter, and thereby the church, teaching authority and the authority to forgive sins. And that's what the binding and loosing means. The authority to teach and preach in his name and to forgive sins. And he's really talking about Peter, but in Matthew chapter 18, he extends that to all the disciples, namely of the apostles and then the priests and so forth, who are going to teach and preach in his name to forgive sins. All right, so that is really an important passage for us to remember as Catholics so that we understand uh, where we come from. So, like I said, like I've been saying all along, the church doesn't make things up willy-nilly. Uh, it's not man-made. It's not just a bunch of uh, men with funny clothes, as I said. And by the way, when, you have, when you're 2,000 years old, you're going to have some funny clothes. <laughs> okay. You're going to adopt some you know, customs and some uh, clothing <laughs> customs that are 2,000 years old. So that's all a part of it. But uh, that's why the church makes the tough stands on you know, same-sex union and abortion and contraception and all these things that people sometimes balk at. And they say, wonder where does the church come up with this? Well, it doesn't pull it out of a hat. It's teaching upon the divine authority that Jesus give it, has given them to preserve the integrity of that gospel so that people may follow the right path. All right, now, did the church really do this? I'm giving you a lot of theory. I'm giving you the biblical foundation for all this. This is St. Peter, by the way. But did the early church really do this? Well, to find out about what the early church did, you can turn to the Acts of the Apostles. And this is what it says. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life and to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. What does the breaking of the bread sound like? Yeah. It sounds like the Eucharist, yeah. So they practiced the Eucharist very early on. They followed the teaching of the apostles. Awe came upon everyone, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles, because the apostles had received the Holy Spirit. So many miracles were performed in the early church. Some people ask, well, why is it that we don't see as many miracles now? Well, that was to get the church going, and that was very important for people to believe. But the signs and wonders weren't there for themselves. It was there for people to, to really believe in Jesus Christ, to be saved. Okay. Ooh, boy. Wish I had a little bit more time here. I'm going to make this real quick. I want to talk briefly about the four marks of the church. We get that from the Nicene Creed when we talk about one holy Catholic, Catholic and apostolic. The first is that we are one. Why are we one? It's because God is one. We are, God is one. There's uh, one, God, uh, one God. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one Lord of all. There's one hope to which we have been called. There's one Bible. There's one Eucharist. You see the unity because God is one, and so the church is meant to be one. The church is also holy, and, and despite some of the, the negative things that the church has done in the past, and the, despite of the fact that we're sinners and that we're, we don't live perfect Christian lives, 
The church remains holy. Why? Because Jesus is the head of the church. And as long as Jesus is the head of the church, the church will always remain holy. There's this great quote from a guy named Morton Kelsey. I'm not sure who he was, but you hear it all the time. The church is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. <laughs> that's you. That's me. That's us. That's our priests. That's our bishops. We're a hospital for sinners. So if anybody says, hey, you guys are blah, 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 or whatever, you can quote this line and say, that's why I'm being saved, brother. <laughs> okay, it's finally, it's apostolic, as I'm, it's Catholic. Oh, yes, what does the word Catholic mean? Universal. It means universal, that's right. This church is for everybody. If God comes down to earth to establish a church, what other church do we need? This is meant for the salvation of everybody to become a part of God's family, as it was in the beginning, as it was meant to be. And so it extends to the farthest reaches of this earth, Wherever you go, the Mass is the same. The rites may be different, but you have the same readings, you have the same order of the Mass, you have the same Eucharist, you have the same church calendar. And it's apostolic because it was founded, as the Bible shows, upon the Twelve Apostles. Now, was this how it was really done in the early church? I just mentioned the Acts of the Apostles, but i got to tell you, folks, I did some research about the church fathers, the fathers of our faith, and they were the ones, they were the first bishops and popes, etc., they are really the ones who gave us so much of our church doctrine upon our, which our church is based upon. And let me tell you, they, they were all very Catholic. Okay, the first guy is St. Irenaeus uh, in the year 189. <clears throat> has everything that I said been true? Well, listen to what he has to say. The true knowledge is the doctrine of the apostles and the ancient organization of the church throughout the whole world and the manifestation of the body of Christ according to the succession of bishops, by which succession the bishops have handed down the church, which is found everywhere. That is the universal church. That's the Catholic church. And you see here, he mentions the church. He mentions apostolic succession. And there he is, St. Irenaeus of Lyon. This is from St. Jerome in 396. Far be it from me to speak adversely of any of these clergy who in succession from the apostles Confect by their sacred word the body of Christ and through whose efforts also it is that we are Christians. What he's saying is far be it for me to speak negatively of these priests because who in succession of the apostles they are apostolic successors and they give us the Eucharist. They confect by their sacred word the Eucharistic prayer, the body of Christ through whose efforts also it is that we are Christians. He's saying without them, without their baptism that they give us, without the Holy Eucharist, without the gospel that they preach to us, we wouldn't even be Christians. And, uh, and from St. Augustine. And uh, if I had more time, I would read from him. He's got a great quote. This is from St. Ignatius of Antioch, and he wrote this in the year 107. Let all be obedient to the bishop as Jesus to the Father, to the priests as to the apostles, and to the deacons as God's law. And he says this about the Eucharist. Partake of the one Eucharist, for one is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and one is the chalice of his blood, one altar and one bishop with the priests and the deacons. Now he's talking about the reality of the Eucharist, which is based upon the bishop and the priests, and the fact that they can, through their uh, the Eucharistic prayers, now that turns into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. All right, and since we're on the topic of the Eucharist, which I love so much, I, I know that it's a little off the top. By the way, this is St. Ignatius of Antioch. He was a bishop and he was martyred. You see the lions here? In fact, the first, oh, I don't know, 12, 15 popes were all martyrs. It's really interesting to see. The early church, if you were a Christian, you paid the price. But to them, it didn't matter. They were going to heaven anyway. Can you imagine if we all lived that way now and we all felt that way? That's really something to live out. But it is the truth. That's him right there. While we're on the subject of the Eucharist, I couldn't resist. This is from uh, Justin Martyr, AD 151. We call this food Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to partake of it, except one who believes our teaching to be true, and who has been, hand who has been washed in the washing which is for the remission of sins, and for regeneration, and is thereby living as Christ enjoyed. For not as common bread or common drink do we receive these, but since Jesus Christ, our Savior, was incarnate by the Word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharist prayer set down by Him, and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nurtured, 
is both the flesh and the blood of that, of that incarnated Jesus. There it is. This sounds like, when I read this, I'm blown away. It sounds like the catechism. It sounds like an encyclical. It's, it sounds like the mass. But it's nearly 2,000 years old. It was written like it was yesterday. This really is the faith that's been handed down to us for 2,000 years. This really is the faith that Jesus handed on to the apostles. You and me, we are a part of something special, something that's nearly 2,000 years old and has been preserved and has been maintained and the integrity that is there and has not been watered down. And we get to experience that as being a part of Christ's body, his living church, which will continue until the end of the time. It is a wonderful gift that we have. Okay. All right, now I want to, I'm really going to uh, switch gears here. Um, by the way, again, if you have any questions, we'll open it up after this video. This video is about 25 minutes long, and it's an excellent one. And so with that, let me go ahead and start that. Okay. Wow. All right. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments about that DVD? I liked it. Really happy to be a captain. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, it, it did too when I first watched it. It just uh, it really brought tears to my eyes just to think how special a family we're part of. But anybody else? Any thoughts? Anything that they said that struck you? No? Okay. Maybe it's just one of those DVDs you just watch and you just ponder and you just say, say thank you, God. Um, <laughs> praise God. I really do. Uh, I love being Catholic. Just, uh, praise God. It just, it's the most wonderful thing on earth. I just... Woo! <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions that they may have had in the beginning part or throughout that you'd like to ask? Yes, Nancy, do you have a question? Um, well, I guess this sort of goes <laughs> what we just saw. I heard a Protestant minister just yesterday say, we are priests. You know, St. Paul said we're priests. And he said, we don't need priests. Because we are priests. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember it, but I think there's Colossians. Um, I, yeah, actually, okay, so what she said was that uh, she heard a Protestant minister say that we're all priests, so therefore we, we don't need priests. And I, I got a couple answers to that question. First of all, I'd have to look up that passage. I'm not familiar with that. That, that doesn't ring a bell with me. But I will say this, the Vatican II... Um, so if you find that, if you'd show that, that'd be great. Uh, but I will say that Vatican II said that we're all called to be priests, prophets, and kings. Well, and the, Okay, so he was reading some Vatican II. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that we're, that's all part of our baptismal calling, is that we're all called to be priests, prophets, and kings. So what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that it takes away from you know, that hierarchical priesthood, which is the conferral of apostolic succession. Uh, because the way the priesthood works is that when you talk about apostolic succession in general, it's the bishops, it's the college of bishops, and priests are considered helpers of the bishops. So that's how they are conferred that same apostolic uh, succession, and the laying of the hands through ordination. So they are part of that line, and deacons are as well. But what does that mean? It means um, a priest is a mediator. You know, we talk about Jesus as being the high priest. He is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so the Bible talks about that. The priest means that you are a mediator for God. You are bringing God to the world. Just like the video talked about, you are a bridge. So it's not just Jesus Christ, but it's his holy Catholic church of which we are his body. We are his members. And so we bridge that gap, just like the video beautifully brought out. I love what the woman said. She said, we need to tell people that Jesus loves you. Yes. We need to tell people that. 
you know, sometimes it's better not to even say, hey, you know what, I'm Catholic, I want you to, as great as that is, I've got a neighbor. You know, I live in this very small fourplex, and uh, I have this neighbor, and we talk about, you know, her vegetables and her garden and everything. And um, I can tell she's lonely, you know, we've talked. And I just, I just want to tell her, I haven't had the courage, but I, I need to. It's very important. Uh, Jesus loves you, you know, and eventually if she wants to know more about the Catholic Church through that, then, then great, but I, I need to tell her that, because we are mediators of God, just like that. That's what, that's what our calling is, priests. And uh, so we do that not only with our words, but our actions as well, and the way we practice our faith. So that's, that's very important. As far as the sacramental ministry, though, uh, no, we aren't actually ordained priests. Yeah. Okay, good, great question. Anybody else? Yes. Not commission, divine commission. That's right. We gave them right to the apostles and their successors. So we may be priests, but not in the same sense mm -hmm. of the commission, right. the divine commission. Right. Not in the same sense, uh, maybe, you know, with the teaching and the sacramental life and, and all that. But certainly, you know, I would say we are commissioned. You know, I, I would say, yeah, you know, we have that responsibility too. There was that wonderful quote once again from the woman. She said, she quoted uh, John Henry Newman. And he said, well, the, you know, the church, if it were just the clergy, you know, it'd look awfully silly. And I think as, as lay people, we need to come back to that, that very basic calling of how we spread the gospel. Too often, people say, well, it's up to the clergy. It's up to the Father Dan's of the world. It's up to, you know, going to Mass. It's up to the deacons. It's up to the Pope. It's, you know, the catechism. What about me? I just show up to Mass. Well, I know most of you aren't that way, but for a lot of Catholics, sadly, they are that way. They think it's just a matter of just mailing it in. And we need to get back to that original baptismal calling of being priests, prophets, and kings and to bring that message to the world. Because if, if other people don't do it, who will? You know, if we don't do it, who will? And so we have an awesome responsibility. But as the Gospel of John showed us, Jesus gives us that power of the Holy Spirit to step out with courage. We also need to find our own calling. You know, because uh -huh. we all can't do the same thing, you know. But how many times have you seen a poor person, you know, maybe they're on that same corner and still begging for money, but you just want to stop the car and say, God loves you, you know. And the Holy Spirit you know, wants you to say that, and sometimes you just hold back. That's kind of spreading the word. Because these people, they just, they just want the money, but maybe... If you could just smile at them, just give them some hope, maybe. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, Kathy just mentioned may, seeing poor people on the street or panhandlers and, you know, sure, maybe they want some money, but they're looking for love mainly. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to know that they're loved or, or that Jesus loves them. They smile um, just to give them some hope. They show them that they are human because often they Make don't believe think. that they have. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think we're obligated to spread God's love and His mercy and forgiveness, but through free will, we can choose to be not complying with that obligation. We can fail to do what we're supposed to do to spread the word. Absolutely. Yeah, she mentioned that you know we are obligated, that we do have that responsibility of sharing the gospel, but we do have free will. And often our free will gets in the way, and so we choose not to, because God doesn't force us to do that. And in our, in our human nature, often we may not have the courage, or we may be lazy, or we don't want to make the effort, or what have you. And so that message can uh, often you know, get sucked into a vacuum. And, and you know, what a tragedy that is, because of what a gift it is to offer. So just like you said, Kathy, I think in simple ways. It doesn't have to be, oh, I've got to come out on a street corner and preach to everybody who comes by. Um, I've often thought about that. Yeah, give me a Bible and I'll go out on the street corner. You know? uh, that'd be kind of cool. But no, God isn't necessarily calling you to do that. Most often, uh, not. And just the actions and the kind words are smiled and uh, to let people know that they are loved, loved in God. Yes. Go ahead, Jack. Um, as most of you know, I, we come from Sacred Heart and back and forth. But this morning I was looking out here and, and in line with what Kathy said, 
about stopping telling people that Jesus loves them. You got a wonderful folder out there. Yes. And if you could oh. reproduce it by the thousands, and everybody carry it in their car, and when you see somebody say, "I personally don't have the ability to help you," but here are a hundred, two hundred organizations that may be able to help you, and just something like that. I mean, you already have the resource out there. And if you, Father Dan and yourself and other people could get used to just having your people carry this in their car so that when they stop at a stoplight or somebody yeah. says, can you spare a dollar? You say, I personally can't, but here's some resources that you need. Which one? That's, Absolutely. That's a great idea, Jack. Same, same, the St. Vincent de Paul pamphlet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. You had to hand them. I, never, I never thought about that. You yeah. know, maybe have some in your car. You know, hey, I don't have the resources now to help you, but here's a great number to call people who will, you know, help you out. Never even thought of a great idea. Next. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts, Cons? Yes, Barbara. We have uh, some people that come to our house, well, that used to come frequently to our house, Jehovah's Witnesses. And when they first came, it was a couple of women. And then when they saw my husband and I, they started sending around <laughs> A black white couple, oh, God. which I thought was interesting. <laughs> We're going to draw you in now because you know we've got somebody else. So at first, I would listen to him. I was real polite and I talked to him and I just, and then you know I would always say God bless you when they left. But I finally got up the courage when they said to me, uh, "Come to our church." I said, "Why would I want to come to your church when I can go to my church?" seven days a week, or six days a week actually, and I can receive Jesus in the body and blood, the true actual body and blood of Christ. Why would I come to your church when I can get Jesus and bring him into my body and he can walk with me and he can be with me? Why? Because this is, I'm not interested in going to your church. I'm going to go to my church where I can receive Jesus. And they haven't been back since. <laughs> <laughs> you do have that pamphlet, so yeah. that, yeah. that, that, that yeah. is really That's nice. That's a great story. That's a great story. And you know, that just reminds me, and you know, we have these new cards now, but don't, that we, you know, we don't need to be afraid of sharing our faith too, why we love it, why we, we are Catholic. Some of the concrete things, like the Eucharist, uh, you know, like the Gospel, like the family that we are, uh, like the sacraments. You know, so many people don't know about that, so uh, feel free to do that in a lot of ways that will actually pique people's interests as well. Wonderful. That will also keep them from coming, too. <laughs> yeah, right. They, they, they might not come back. <laughs> exactly. But, all right. Anybody else with any uh, thoughts or comments or questions? I have a question about the Twelve Apostles. Yeah. After Judas betrayed uh -huh. Jesus, then there was only 11, but right. they still talk about the 12 thrones in heaven, so who mm -hmm. is the 12? Oh, what they did, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, what they did is they elected Matthias, St. Matthias, and he became the successor, if you will, to Judas, so there still are 12 apostles. Great question. Okay. okay, all right, well, let's go ahead and end with the prayer, then. Okay. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this uh, wonderful day, for your holy Catholic Church, for your love and your gospel and all the mercies that you extend to us through your holy family the church, uh, through the priests, through the pope, through your gospel, through the Bible, through tradition, through the laity, through the saints, through your teachings, through your mother Mary. Oh, it goes on and on and on. We thank you for that. We ask that you may continue to bless us in our journey, in our mission, so that we may not be afraid to share the good news with others, so that we may have courage and that we may step out and answer that baptismal calling to become priests for others and become Christ for others as well. And we thank you and we praise you and we ask for all blessings for all those who do, do not know you or your Holy Catholic Ch Church today. And we pray... Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among men, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.
Before I forget, again, tomorrow is going to be the video from Scott Hahn, The Splendor of the Catholic Church at 9 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. And I have handouts from...